Hey, this is Mark, and I'm back with another great episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, we have a real-life 007 on our hands. His name is Jack Barsky. Jack was born in East Germany. He was later recruited by Stasi, the East German police, which then was brought up into the whole KGP program. And his mission was to come to the U.S., in this case, New York City, to influence political groups, and in fact, actually tried to go after and buddy up with Jimmy Carter's National Security Advisor. So this whole story is a tale of cloak and dagger. It's a story of him sending notes back to Russia. He'd have to put them on a secret piece of paper and put them under a rock and all the different clandestine operations that he had to do. He did this for over 10 years before he was discovered. And we go through the whole story. Just absolutely fascinating. So stay tuned for that. And as always, remember to rate and review and go in to iTunes. It really does help us out. It creates a lift on what we're trying to do is spread the message about finding your summit, people overcoming adversity, and finding their way. And of course, if you want to find out anything about what I'm up to, www.markpattisonnfl.com. All right. So on that note, stay tuned. This is an amazing episode. Let's go talk to Jack. Here we go. Hey, everybody. It's Mark. I'm back with another amazing podcast. And today I've got a real life James Bond type 007, who's a former spy, Jack Barsky. This is going to be an amazing, amazing podcast, I think, for a whole lot of reasons. Growing up in East Germany, and ultimately coming to the U.S. as a spy. We're going to trace this whole story on how this whole thing came to be. But let me start off by saying I am beaming from Sun Valley, Idaho, all the way to someplace outside of Georgia, in Atlanta. Jack Barsky, how you doing? I'm all right. Just recovered from a very long book tour in Europe, which was mostly Germany, but also three days in Poland, and a quick trip to Sweden, where the book came out in Polish as well as Swedish. So. Going international now. So you're talking about the book Deep Undercover, which we're going to get into, but how many different languages did you guys print that in? It's in three languages now. It's English, German, no, four, Polish and Swedish. So certainly with your Russian background, I am surprised that it is also not in Russian. (laughs) I don't want to go anywhere near a Russian publisher that may have connections with Putin because anything big in Russia nowadays it lives by the grace of Vladimir, so no thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, as I was doing some of this background information, and we're kind of going forward, but I think it is important to mention that you are the longest surviving member of that KGB class or crew or old spots. I'm not sure how to categorize you guys. Uh, to the extent known to me and to the extent known to my contacts at the FBI, I beat the previous record by a few months, and the previous record was held by Colonel Abel, who is also known as sort of the spy in the Bridge of Spies. Mm -hmm. When I trained with the KGB, he was our super super superhero because he managed to do all kinds of things when in fact he didn't, but that was a build-up by the propaganda machine, both on the American side and the Russian side. This is how it works sometimes. You take an individual... And the Americans claimed, oh, look who we caught. We caught this incredibly skillful legal spy. And the Russians then, when they got him back, say, look who we had there, right in the middle of where the things happened. Neither one was true, but he did happen to manage to live a little over nine years illegally in the U.S. before he was caught. I lived 10. Mm-hmm. And then I resigned, and I spent another seven years before the FBI caught up. I only counted 10. It's enough. <laughs> Well, let's go back and figure out how all this came to be. I can't even imagine. I talked to Pete Turner earlier, who's a colleague of yours, and Pete was a guy that was American, born U.S., that was put in the Croatian conflict in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and his whole thing was to gather information from the locals. And you were doing something quite different. You are the opposite side of that table of actually infiltrating the U.S. as a East German, but through the KGB of Russia, to gather all kinds of information. So let's start off with growing up in the Eastern Bloc of East Germany. I am so fascinated by a lot of this, because my era growing up, we talked about this shortly before we went on, 
was when it was really the Cold War. It was us versus them, and good versus, as Ronald Reagan put it, evil. And I'm not adhering to any one of those one way or the other, because I think people are people at the end of the day. But I can't imagine growing up in a city, East Germany, I've been to Germany, where there's an actual wall that says you cannot go outside that wall unless you have permission. Well, that's right. Well, I tell you what, I grew up with a very clearly defined picture as to who the enemy was. We call that Feindbild. And the enemy was the United States and West Germany. And that's a fact, a historic fact, that the West German government was infested with ex-Nazis. And we know, and some of that is historically accurate as well, that the CIA did a lot of mischief around the world. We put two and two together, and we had the Soviet Union that defeated Hitler. So we were on the right side of history, period, P. Of course, that was all embellished and, and added to by tons and tons of propaganda indoctrination from childhood on. So to some of us who didn't have relatives in the West and who didn't know anybody who had relatives in the West, that wall was meaningless. It was just to make sure that the bad capitalists and ex-Nazis would not come in instead mm. of what really meant was to keep people from leaving, which to me, I thought it wasn't an issue. I didn't know anybody who wanted to leave. That's an interesting perspective, and I've actually never heard that, but it makes a lot of sense to me. It wasn't so much about leaving. It was about preventing others from coming in. So I get that, creating that yeah. moat around your country. So you were born Albrecht Diedrich, correct? Yeah, you you butcher that name. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's the toughest name to pronounce because it has in it. And so, <laughs> well, why don't you give it to me in Eastern German or German? Albrecht Dietrich. The Dich sound is a tough one for American speakers. So as you were being raised by your parents, I read that you were sent off to a boarding school when you were 14. So even at this right. early, early age, you were being taught to kind of take care of yourself, correct? That's right. I credit my mother with that. I remember faintly that she said she was in a boarding school for some time and she loved it. So off I went. I was gone Monday through Saturday, middle of the day. I was not at home. That started me off on a path of independence very early, unlike today's young people. Well, yeah, I've got two girls, you know, so it, it is a different age. It is a different time. But, I mean, they still have boarding schools, certainly back on the East Coast, and I'm sure in Europe. The reason why I brought that up is because, to me, it seems like there was a tie, certainly, as you just mentioned, about gaining your independence and going off, ultimately, to the U.S., and just really fending on your own what you're going to do in your life and how you're going to make it. That very astute observation that continued then. I happened to pick a college or a university to go to that was as far away from my home as possible. When I first started there, it took me 12 hours to get from my home to that place. And as a result, I could never go home on the weekends. Almost all of my fellow students, they were gone. Saturday, middle of the day, when lab work was over, they all headed home. I stayed because I had to. I could only go home for the holidays. And where was that college? That was in Jena, which is, in, it isn't that far away, but in those days, public transportation was so slow and the connections were bad. It was about 150 miles away from home. It took 12 hours to travel that. Mm, man, that's a long way. And I can certainly understand why you wouldn't go back home. I mean, hopping on a train in 12 hours, I mean, that's half a day. Yeah. and. It didn't make any sense. So I was on my own pretty much. So you're off in college. How did you get recruited? I mean, so I, I'm putting myself in your shoes, right? And yeah. I go off to the University of Washington, located in Seattle, and I'm playing football. But I've never been approached by anybody to say, hey, would you come? We want to put you in Russia or some other country <laughs> to work as an undercover spy and go through this whole cloak and dagger life. I'd see that in movies, but I can't imagine... How do you even get approached? Well, the approach was, obviously, I didn't expect it. I had no connection with the East German secret police, Stasi. This was one day there was a knock on the door. Some guy comes in and gives me a cock and bull story where he was from. I knew that from the moment he opened his mouth that he had something else in mind. I thought he was East German secret police, but he wasn't. We talked a lot of nonsensical stuff. And then he said, so in the future, could you imagine to work for the government one day? Which 
I was tempted to ask him, so what branch of the government to put him, you know, make him uncomfortable? I dropped that because I sort of knew what he was after. And I said, you know, yeah, but not as a chemist. So I had an idea that he was going down the path of what we called Kunshatta des Friedens, or in translation, something like Scout for Peace. It was like our way of calling spies not spies. And that was intriguing. And we met a couple of times in a restaurant. And the second time he introduced me to somebody with a Russian accent and said, oh, by the way, we work with our Soviet comrades. And there I was in the hands of the KGB. That didn't mean anything. That means only that they had identified me as a potential candidate. I have no idea what the ratio was, but I bet you that at least nine out of 10 didn't make it past round one. This was a very, very slow, deliberate process to determine whether I was capable of doing what they thought I could do. So as a East German, did you have any preconceived ideas on what secret police Stasi meant to you? Was that a negative term or was that a positive term and neutral? To me, actually, to be quite honest, I don't want to put my current knowledge in the mix here. But to me, in those days, it was a legitimate police force that fought the enemy. It was a counterintelligence and it was intelligence in service of the communist cause. It was all good. Yeah, uh, so it would be like saying the FBI. you just like, oh, it's the FBI. Sure. Nowadays, the FBI knocks on your door and says, hey, we need your help. You say, yeah, sure, I'm going to help you. So same thing. I had no clue the extent of the internal spying that those folks did. I didn't know anybody at the time who was by that spying. So I just didn't know. But to me, that was, that was good, uh, whatever. And the KGB, that was the big leads. Yeah, and because the Russians had come and banded forces with the Allies and they had taken out Hitler, the Russians weren't necessarily an adversary to you. That would just be, yeah, I mean, it would seem like if you grew up there and now they freed you and now they're splitting up the city as everybody's taking their territory and you're just part of that Eastern Bloc, right? The Russians were our big brother. They were the ones that we were imitating and they were the ones that would lead us into communist paradise and everything in the West was just bad and was enemies. What I hated was what Hitler and his cohorts had done. But I didn't hate the Western politicians. I just said, they're in the way. They need to be defeated. Well, it's certainly, in so many cases, you're a product of your environment, right? We're here in the U.S., and you get all the propaganda. You saw this definitely influence on this last election, right? It says they get on TV, and they infiltrate Facebook and these different ads, and they're either positive or negative about different people and different issues. So I certainly understand how that would be. It's all about primarily what impacts the way people act, think, and so forth, the most is feelings. When you generate negative or positive feelings in one direction, then the reason gets thrown out the door. And so what happened with us, it was feelings, even though we thought we were rational and what's happening nowadays on the left and on the right, it's all about, I feel that they are wrong and I feel that they are wrong. It's a, rational thinking is in high demand and it doesn't exist very much. So let's go back to, you've got this Stasi agent, and you've got this Russian colleague that he's introduced you to, and you're now connecting with him several times, and both those two guys. And then in 1973, they give you 24 hours to make a decision to do what? Yep, well, after about a year and a half of meetings and little tasks and lots of talk, my Russian handler at the time decided, and had written reports, I'm assuming, to his headquarters, that I was a good candidate. So I was sent to Berlin for a three-week trial. That was my first secret meeting. And I had a, a new uh, liaison there who... Wait a minute, go back for a second. So now you go off to Berlin, and you have your yeah. first secret meeting. Did this, you know, you get like a doorbell ring, and you open your door, and there's something under the carpet, and then you have to go down and no, take no, five no. paces and take a left? And No, no, no. <laughs> I was sent to Berlin with... Not a name, not a phone number, but with an address and a time and code, such as you ask a question and you get a stupid answer when you meet somebody. That was a clandestine meeting. You meet somebody who you have not seen, and it's the same, a person who's going to show up at a certain street corner at a certain time. You say, uh, hello, I'm looking for this guy with the yellow poodle who just walked past you. 
have you seen him? And he gives you some kind of an idiotic answer, and then you know that you are the right people. Mm -hmm. And what did they want to talk to you about? Oh, no. I was told it was sort of a test meeting. And the testing was, I got more tasks. I spent three weeks reading West German literature. One time, two days before my departure, I was then taken to the headquarters of the Soviet Army, which also was the headquarters of the East German KGB, and introduced to some big shot. He didn't speak English or German, so he talked Russian, and I listened. And sometimes I had to get some translation. But eventually, after about 12 minutes of ranting and raving, he said, so are you not? I didn't expect that question. I said, I don't know. I need more training. And he said, don't worry. We will take care of that. We just need to know. This is a moment to make a decision. I want your decision tomorrow. Ouch. This is like when people just push stuff away. It says, you know, yeah, okay, sometime in the future, I'll figure this out. Yeah. In the meantime, it was interesting. All of a sudden, it was black and white. You do this or you do that. And it is black and white. If I say no, I could walk away from this. And there goes all the idea of helping communism to victory and being a great hero and adventure. And if I say yes, I have to say goodbye to everything that I had worked for and that I was going to enjoy a great career in East Germany and so forth. So that was a tough decision. There's and I had 24 hours to make. Did you think or in your head were there any consequences? Meaning, and you just mentioned, you just outlined, you said, hey, if I don't do this, I don't get to be a part of the adventure and travel and everything else. But was there any unspoken, like, if you don't do this, we're going to hurt your mom or something? No. And that wouldn't make any sense. You see, you don't force somebody into that kind of a role. You can blackmail or bribe somebody who was already in a position to handle secrets. You don't force somebody into an undercover role. That wouldn't work. Because that person at the first moment, at the first opportunity, opt out. Walking away would have had no consequences for me. So you started to go there, and then you went in a little bit different direction. But I want to ask you about going to West Berlin in those days, because yep. there was a wall, for those who don't know or remember, there was a wall that separated. And how you got through, I'm sure there were several points, was Checkpoint Charlie, right? The remnants of that wall are still there, and it's an ugly, gray, concrete piece of wall. I actually tunneled under, so to speak. The entrance for us and people, Stasi, KGB, whoever, was a subway station, Bahnhof Friedrichstraße, not too far from Checkpoint Charlie. There was this checkpoint there was guarded only by the Russians. There was no Americans on the other side. So you went through there, showed your pass to a Russian guard, and off you went. You got on the platform on a subway, and you entered the subway, and it took you to the West. I don't know why the Americans allowed that, but that's how everybody was smuggled into the West, through that particular checkpoint. Yeah, so that's how you made that happen. Interesting. Okay, so now it's 1978, and through your training and everything else, you get sent to the U.S., right? Yep. And what was your mission? Well, the mission was to primarily, first of all, establish myself as an American. And when I did that, that was already a success. At minimum, I was now established as a sleeper agent, which was of great value by the KGB and the Soviet Union, whether that was real value, and that is, at this point, I think, questionable, but that's the way they thought in those days. Before you go on to the second thing, what does the word sleeper agent mean? Oh, a sleeper is somebody who operates like a normal individual in American society, doesn't do any spying, just sits there, establishes a residence and all full documentation, so is not known by law enforcement to have a record just in case he or she is needed. What happened about a month ago when the Russians kicked a bunch of diplomats out and we yeah. kicked the yeah. diplomats out, all those diplomats were spies. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. So when you lose all your spies in the other country, then you only have your sleepers left uh -huh. to give you some information of any kind. Yeah, interesting. So going back just to getting here, this is more like cloak and dagger stuff. It sounds like you were sent to Mexico and then you went through Canada and you're going through with different passports. How do you get all this stuff? Well, I left Moscow. Obviously, I got there. And then to exchange passports, I would meet resident agents that as under the cover of diplomats that were KGB agent, one in Vienna and the other one was in 
Rome, but I also met people in Helsinki. I had one of those clandestine meetings and quickly exchanged passport. I gave him one, he gave me a new one, and off I went as a different person. Again, I'm just going off the movies, and it certainly sounds a lot like a James Bond old John Connery where he's got the briefcase, he opens it up, and he's got a bunch of seven different passports and a gun and money and different currencies and everything else. No, you should never be caught with two passports. That's already, that's, and I have to disappoint your listeners, I didn't use any gadgets. My hands never touched a weapon other than a BB gun. So that part you can just like put out of your mind. But the other part in terms of moving around undercover, so to speak, and doing clandestine meetings and all that and changing identities, that's all true. Well, there's a variety of forms of weapons and you're in the information space. That can be just as powerful in terms of giving away secrets and how people do things as well as just an actual weapon. So I totally get that. My natural weapon was supposedly my brain. I don't know how good it was, but that's <laughs> what I was trained to use. Okay, so now you land in what city? New York? Is that where you land when you come in? I set foot in on American soil in Chicago at Chicago O'Hare. Okay, and then where's the plan for you to go live? Well, the plan was, and we executed that plan to establish residence in New York City. I had to live someplace where there were other Russians. That means diplomats or trade mission employees. And there were only in those days three cities where you could interact with those folks. It was Washington, D.C., New York, and San Francisco. New York was the best place by far. They had an army of agents, both as employees of the U.N. as well as Soviet representatives at the United Nations. There were 150 or so. That's amazing. At what point in time did you change your name to Jack Barsky? One day after I arrived in the United States, I came as a William Dyson, citizen of Canada. That was a false passport. And after one night in the U.S., I destroyed that passport and pulled out a certified copy of a birth certificate of Jack Barsky, a young boy who died at the age of 10, then I you know, assumed his identity and fundamentally stole it. How difficult is it today with all the difference? I mean, ever since 9-11, it seems like the entire game has stepped up at a whole different level in terms of you go to the airport, you have to go through different screening, and when you're going in and out of a country, just the way that they look at your backgrounds and everything, how difficult do you think it is today to be able to pull off what you did in terms of having multiple identities as you travel around the world? All right. First of all, what I pulled off in terms of becoming an American is fundamentally the way I did it is impossible because you can't get a social security card anymore as an adult. Mm -hmm. You were born in this country, you get one at birth, period. However, and now I'm going to give you an answer that's based on my interaction with my good friend Günther, and that's part of my odd story. My good friend Günther, with whom I studied, was an employee at the Stasi, eventually headed the forgery department, and they were the best in the business. And he will tell you, if they make it, you can copy it. In other words, it is still possible, but the effort to forge documentation is fundamentally much more difficult. For instance, if you shadow, just one little wrinkle, if you shadow somebody else, let's say you steal somebody else's identity, but that person still exists, mm -hmm. you got to make damn sure that that person isn't in the same space at the same time as you are when you're traveling. You need most likely insider information. You need somebody on the other side who has access to records, personnel records, or how passports are made and so forth. But it's not impossible any security measure can be defeated, but it takes a whole lot more effort these days. And that's one of the reasons that the, you remember 2010, there were like five Russian illegals caught in the U.S. Mm -hmm. They were both ill-prepared and acted the way they were prepared in an amateurish fashion. It's just almost impossible. And I doubt that the business of sending illegals to another country today is as flourishing as it was in the 50s, 60s. In 70s, when I was part of the last wave that the Soviet Union sent over. Okay, so it's nice to hear that from your point of view, it's much more difficult on a whole different level to get somebody else's identity and assume that. So that's great for the world. 
So now you are sent here as a sleeper agent, and your goal was to become close with the American society and make contacts with foreign policy leaders right. and get close with President Carter's national security advisor. How do you do that? I just well, that, 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 that Brzezinski, that's sort of an urban legend that somehow I mentioned in my interview with 60 Minutes, I mentioned Brzezinski as an example and then it, somebody took that and said, well, he was supposed to, he targeted Zbigniew Brzezinski. I did not. It was just an example. You know, yeah. they said, well, look here, there's Institute of Foreign Relations at Columbia University. There's the Hudson Group think tank. I forgot the exact name. And the Trilateral Commission. They said, people like that, organizations like that, if you could get to know somebody. And they were very much interested in finding out what are the plans of the decision makers in the United States. And because of my low standing in society, I didn't succeed. Respect. I didn't get to know any one of those. Okay, so you land in Chicago. Now you're, the goal is to get into Chicago because there's a lot of diplomats slash spies that are there. There's a Russian community and everybody else that were around you. What was your job? You know, what did you tell them? Hey, my name is Jack, and I do what? No, well, I didn't tell anybody anything. I just was. Initially, the first year of my existence in the U.S., once I arrived in New York, I established residence in one of those residency-type hotels uh, where you pay by the month. Yep. It was not a nice hotel, but it was private. I had my own bathroom and a, a little hot plate to cook and a little fridge. And I spent the first year literally getting to know the city and acquiring documentation. It took a long time. It wasn't that easy. And a driver's license, particularly, and then the social security card. During that time, I had no interaction with anybody other than people I did business with. Uh, it was, that was a pretty lonely existence. And then after a year, I had my social security card. I got a job as bike messenger in Manhattan that paid pretty well. Based on that job, I could get an apartment. And I slowly started integrating in society. The bike messenger platform wasn't a great platform to socialize with. So I usually, when I met people, I would, wouldn't would even tell them what I did. When they asked, I said, you know, I do some accounting. But integration really didn't happen until after I had this college degree because I got another degree. And then all of a sudden I was somebody. Like, you know, I'm a programmer. I work for a big company, blah, blah, blah. That took altogether five years. Was the Russian government paying you? Were you on some kind of salary? I was on salary. The moment I earned money myself by working in the U.S., I received $600 per month. That was pretty much put on my account in Moscow that accumulated over time. In addition, they paid half of my rent, my medical expenses, of which I didn't have much. And down the road, I bought a car for a couple of thousand dollars and half of the expenses for gasoline. Did you ever get to a point in all this where you were just like, you know what, I'm not making enough money. I mean, I know that you were supplementing it with this messenger bike thing, and, but I don't want to do this anymore. Or did you see no. it more as this? No. no? Not at all. See, I was still on a mission, and I was a very conscientious type of employee. Money at that point still was not something that drove me. I didn't sign up for money. Yeah, it was nice to have things, and it was very nice to be able to go back home occasionally and take expensive things back, not so much for myself, but I had a wife in Germany. That gave me great joy, and eventually I wanted to have a house and, and sort of like the American lifestyle. For myself, no. I was wired from childhood on to delay gratification to a point where I don't even need it. So no, that was never an issue for me. This whole story is just incredible. So you now are getting immersed into the American culture, you're getting all these different documents, you're infiltrating, it took you five years. Do you think that your time that you were trying to do your stated goal, infiltrate foreign policy leaders, trying to figure out, was that successful? How yes. Was, yep. Absolutely. They were very happy with me. That part I did really well because I had to improvise and it gets to be too much to talk about the details, how this all worked out. That's in the book. I got a pat on the shoulder, and I got the second highest decoration of the Soviet Union for that, which, by the way, came with uh, $30,000. Wow. Not rubles, but dollars. So they were happy with me. 
actual results of espionage, I felt guilty because I didn't have a lot. I may have underestimated one aspect of it because I did uh, profile a lot of young people, particularly young people, but also others who they could have recruited. But that feedback I never got as to whether somebody was recruited or not. But that's it. So I felt sort of guilty. All of a sudden, I wasn't the best. I used to be the best at everything I was doing. But at this point, I knew I wasn't the best. I really handled no secrets. And I didn't meet anybody who had state secrets. So when you're actually delivering these secrets over, how did you get them to the Soviets? Was that a, obviously it wasn't email, but were you meeting somebody around the corner and you deliver that kind of message? How did that work? In regular mail with secret writing, that's something that you compose a regular letter and then you put, with the use of some copy paper, a secret message on there that would be developed in back in Moscow. If I had too much of information to hand over, I wrote it on pieces of paper, photographed the pieces of paper, and then handed over the undeveloped film in a what's called a dead drop operation, where I would put this, the cartridge in some kind of an innocent-looking container, like maybe an old oil can, or I, I made a, a rock out of plaster of Paris, and put it someplace at a predefined point at a certain time for somebody else to pick it up. That happened only twice or three times. In 1988, the Soviets believed, this is, again, straight out of a movie to me at least, in 1988, the Soviets believed that you'd been compromised, that your identity was out there, that the CIA knew who you were. So, as I read, there was some kind of a red painting yep. on the cement, which was the indicator that you'd been exposed. And were they asking you or telling you to come back to the Soviet Union? That's right. There was a red dot roughly the size of my fist. Uh, here's a, you're getting a scoop now. Nobody in the U.S. has been knows this story because I just found that out. Back in Germany, I met a colleague of mine who was also an undercover agent, ex-German physicist, was recruited by the KGB, uh, worked in New York at the same time I did, and he was recalled in 1988 as well. And he went back. He spent a couple of months in the Soviet Union, and they said, oops, false alarm, you can go back. So they sent him back. So somehow... They must have gotten spooked by something or somebody saying something silly. That's normal. When you think that there's some guy who's, who's spilling the beans, then you pull all your agents back, and they wanted me to go back. And that red dot on that supporting beam there for the subway, and the elevated subway in Queens, New York, that was the signal that says, don't even look back. Go get enough money to get you to Canada, and then you will be exfiltrated, and your mission is over. And the reason why you didn't do that is because either the FBI or the CIA had come in now and met with you and said, look, at you got a choice? <laughs> that sounds like a movie. No, this is something that's very hard to actually depict in a movie. There was the fact that I had an 18-month-old child in this country, mm. a little girl named Chelsea, who is now 30 years old. And ultimately, this was a lot of back and forth in my mind, and ultimately I just couldn't leave her. And so I sent the Russian message in secret writing, that I wouldn't be coming. And if I tell your listeners whether they accepted it or not and why they accepted it, if they did, then I'm, then I'm telling them too much about what's in the book. We want people to also read a little bit. No, I totally get that. But the bottom line is that you did end up staying here and became a U.S. citizen. I think that's the core part of the story. So let me ask you this. During this entire time, when it's this whole cloak and dagger and clandestine operations and you're sending notes and you're infiltrating these different political groups, at night, did you sleep with one eye open, not sure who's going to come through? For me, it would be stressful. For you, maybe not. Well, here's the thing. First of all, I bet you it was stressful, but I was so used to stress that I didn't notice it. Sleep? Here's the thing. I used a moderate amount of alcohol to go to sleep every night. Every night since I got to this country, when I say moderate, two or three glasses of wine, I really didn't, I didn't get drunk. But to, just to deaden the thoughts and be able to sleep. Fear, I had not. Because when I signed up for this nonsense, I knew that I might wind up in jail. But I also knew that the death penalty would not be forthcoming and eventually the Russians would get me out. So, yeah, but you can't run around. And this is one of the characteristics I have. I am basically a high-risk person. 
I've always taken, even from childhood on, have taken risks that seem foolish and are foolish, and always with the thought that everything will be all right. So that's the reason I could actually operate in that way. This, you sort of get used to this it's daily life. And every Thursday I listen to shortwave radio and decipher what they're telling me. And once or twice a month I mail a letter with secret writing. You get so used to it that eventually you also make do a lot of shortcuts. And you're not as watchful anymore. For that reason, and a bunch of other reasons, there's a sort of a natural shelf life for a secret agent. And that tops out at around 10 or 12 years. That's by experience. After that, either the agent gets caught or they're so comfortable in a new country that they defect. So in my case, there was a, after 10 years, there was a little girl that made me sort of defect. Yeah, that's wonderful. So you've got this book out called, and I mentioned it before, called Deep Undercover. How long has that been in print? It's been out for a year now. It just came out, as I indicated in the beginning of this conversation, in Germany, Poland, and Sweden yep. just uh, this past March. So book still, I still make the rounds. I'm, I'm traveling. I'm giving presentations. Here. I just came from one just prior to this interview. And the book's still selling at moderate levels. Uh, it's not a bestseller, but it's doing reasonably well. And can you also get this as an audiobook? I'm now asking for me. I do. I, I'm up in the mountains a lot, and I love listening to podcasts and audiobooks. Yeah, it is available on what's the Amazon Kindle? Uh, no, as a Kindle, it's available as well, but on Amazon as an audiobook. Okay, great. And you, so obviously, you can get it on on Amazon. Is there any other place you can get this book? Well, you know, various bookstores, but there's a lot of bookstores who don't carry these types of books. I would recommend Amazon. They will most likely undersell everybody else. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We're going to put all this stuff in the show notes, and we're going to put the link to this book, Deep Undercover by Jack Barsky. And the story, as we started the conversation, is so fascinating to me. And I know I've got pages of notes, and I left <laughs> out. <laughs> I mean, yeah. literally, we've been talking now for 45 minutes, and I could go another 45 easy with you. But I think we'll honor the fact that all the other details are in the book and encourage everybody to go out there and buy that book. I've never had an interview where the interviewer didn't say, oh, my God, I'm running out of time. I'm not bragging about it. See, I can't claim credit for this story. I didn't make it. I didn't plan it. I stumbled through it, and out came a phenomenally rich material that when I'm looking back, I'm shaking my head and I'm saying, what the hell happened? That would be a great subtitle for the book, by the way. <laughs> Love that. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, also, I have a website. It's called jackbarsky.com. If people are interested, I have a calendar there that shows where I'm going to be. in two weeks from now, I'm going to be in Dallas for a couple of days. If people are interested in connecting that way, that's also a possibility. That's great. I will leave you with this, that through my climbing, I've been in Russia, I've been in Moscow, I've been in St. Petersburg, I've been down in the Caucasus Mountains, and I got to tell you, it was a wonderful experience to be there, and as I'm especially like in St. Petersburg, which I'm sure you've been, you know, just the structure of the city, and oh, yeah. I went into a pharmacy, and just like you buy your toothpaste and everything else, and there was a gal that was sitting there that was offering vodka shots, and so it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So when in Russia, why not? So uh, you'd mentioned wine as a way to kind of calm your nerves at night, and I'm surprised that you didn't say Russian vodka. So No, while in Russia, Zolichnoya, I spent two years in Moscow. Zolichnoya was incredibly cheap. It was four rubles. It was the genuine article. Uh, you had to know where to find it, though. You couldn't get it in the big stores. There was usually some hole in the wall <laughs> where they would sell it. But it was four rubles. Yeah. Yeah. I had Stolichna there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Well, I certainly understand, too. It's dark and cold there during the winter time, So people are trying to just warm up just a little bit. So I understand that mentality. Jack, thank you so much. It's been yeah. an honor to talk to you. Very fascinating. And best luck on your book. And I will certainly do thank everything you. I can to promote this when it comes out, okay? Well, sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nice talking to you. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. 
And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on MarkPattisonNFL.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.